here's one of the things if I, as I go back here's one of the things that, that that's that's interesting or that makes sense for all of these knowledge areas scope schedule cost quality resources communication risk procurement we come up with a plan first after we come up with the plan for how to do it and 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 what we're trying to do is really based off the charter right we came up with the plan of how to figure that scope out and then how to make it into a schedule how to determine a budget etc cetera, etc cetera. we have to identify the stakeholders first and then we make a plan to engage them right so just remember that for the exam this this is the opposite we're planning for folks that we've already identified all right so and our, and our point here isn't about communication, but it's about engagement. It's about that some folks need to be involved real heavily in the beginning, not so much in the middle and a lot at the end, and we need to have a plan to do that. And a plan to do that also involves communication, but those are separate knowledge areas. This is about engaging folks. So current versus desired engagement. That's what we're looking at. That's what this process is about. Right? And we need an actionable plan so that we can achieve that, that desired engagement. And that, and that engagement level may be that um, when people come to meetings, uh, most of the time everybody has their laptop and they're, they're, they're typing in. And then when you ask a question, then they look up and sometimes they don't know and we have to repeat the question. How do we engage stakeholders so that that doesn't happen? Right? And there's a myriad of, of, of scenarios that we go through within our meetings and, and, and working with the different folks. But this is what this, this, this process is about. So yes, we take the charter because how you engage stakeholders is part of the plan to achieve the goal, right? That has a high level goal. We'll use the, re the project management plan specifically resource communications and risk, right? That makes sense in terms of dealing with stakeholders, but not limited to that, by the way. Um, same thing, when you see this project management plan and project documents, just because we have these listed out here doesn't mean that that's the exhaustive list of, of the documents that you would take into account. It's just the ones that you would likely in this scenario. Any contracts that exist, because anytime you sign a contract with another party, they become a key stakeholder to your project. All right, make a mental note of that or write that down. Because by the way, that's, that's another term that's not in the PMBOK, but is used on the exam all the time, a key stakeholder. Remember, we get our project management plan signed off on by the PM, the team, the sponsor, and key stakeholders. Well, anytime you sign an agreement, any contract, they become a key stakeholder to your project for the exam. So as you're studying for the next you know, three or four weeks, all contractors are key stakeholders. Okay, EFs and OPAs, we'll look at these tools and techniques, how we gather information about stakeholders, analyze it, make decisions, and then represent those decisions. And then the output is gonna be an engagement plan. So let's start there, all right? We're trying to create a stakeholder engagement plan. So literally, we would build off that stakeholder register. We would go back to the stakeholder register. And now that we have the list of all of these stakeholders that we might, that we may be able to tag them and group them together and come up for, with strategies for groups of stakeholders and then also strategies for individuals within those groups. It's kind of like just, we keep adding columns. We keep adding columns to that, uh, to that stakeholder register. And we think about the methods of communication approaches, right? When to push, when to pull, when to be interactive, when it be formal or informal, when it be written or verbal. We think about those things. We think about their risk appetite. Right? That's why I'll take the, the, the risk management plan as well when, as an input when we're creating this. So this is the output that we're, we're trying to get. It's just, so this, this is one of those that can, you know, even though it's a management plan, as you, as you think about it, you know, it's, it's an extension of the document. You know, whereas even though with, with risk, we create a plan we track risk in a risk register that ultimately have a, a qualitative, quantitative, and risk response plan within the register, and then we'll create a secondary risk report. Here, we'll create a stakeholder register, and then we'll create a, a, a separate plan for how to engage them. But it is still a, an, an extension of, of the register. And that's what provides us sort of the information on, on our approach. Right, the charter, the register, any plans. All right, so these are the key inputs that, that we're gonna take, along with any assumptions that we, that we may have. And let me go back. There's a key bit of information. Same thing here. 
there's times where we need to engage contractors at certain times, even contractors who you know that in a year and a half long project, you're not going to engage them until two thirds along the way. And they're stakeholders now. They don't even know it. You intend to reach out to them right at a later point. And so you know that at some point you got to engage them early on and make sure they either A, have resources or they have the right person, et cetera, et cetera. So you'll see examples on the exam that kind of tie to this. Analyze that data, just like when we're doing stakeholder analysis. But now we're talking about what are the constraints of being able to engage people, meaning can I get them into the office? Must I, must I travel to them? How are we going to communicate? Video, telephone, you know, how do we do that? We'll look at when folks disengage, we may use root cause analysis to figure out what those reasons are. And then how we'll make decisions, prioritization and ranking of stakeholders. So if you remember when we did stakeholder analysis, we, we did all that analysis to determine, you know, what's their level of power, what's their level of interest, who should we manage closely, who should we keep informed, who should we keep satisfied, right? But now that we determined what, we, how, how we're gonna, what we're gonna do, now we gotta make actionable items to keep them satisfied, to keep them informed, right? To manage them closely. Now, so that's what we're doing here. We're now making actions to, to, to go and achieve those goals. And one of the things that you can use is a stakeholder engagement matrix, and it shows those folks who have no idea that the project is happening, you know, but they're affected the most. Those are the <laughs> unaware folks. It always strikes me when that happens. You got the folks who, um, this project is actually going to help you, but oh my gosh, this is the third ERP we've implemented in the last five years. I don't want to change again, right? The resistant folks, they don't want to go to something new. You got the neutral folks, look. I do good work when I'm here, but you know, I check in at eight, I check out at five, don't call me, don't email me after hours, I'm not responding, right? They're just neutral. Supportive folks, hey, this project is great, you know, and they'll, they'll be the cheerleader until um, you know, you actually need them. And then the leading folks, who will tell everybody how great the project is, and you know, they're like a project champion. And um, you know, we wanna find these folks and arm them with information, so, that's kind of the idea here is figure out where they're at and then come up with some category to get them where you want them to be. And, and the C's and D's are current versus desired. Is that what that is? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> so a lot of work to do if you got some, see, it's almost like if you have someone who's unaware, it's easier to get them to become supportive than if you have someone who's resistant, right? Obviously, but even more so than someone who's neutral because they kind of know both sides and they're just indifferent, all right? You'll waste a lot of time. It's kind of like the whole 80-20 rule. So we'll use, we'll use um, matrices like these also to not only just to see what their strategy is, but where should we be putting a lot of our resources, if you will, our efforts in? Sometimes it's not worth the effort. We may have a strategy and then determine, but it's not worth the effort. Which document created by the identify stakeholders process is a key input to the planned stakeholder management process, helping to provide detailed information on each stakeholder? Stakeholder register. Register. Which data representation tool did the team use? Engagement matrix. So that's it for planning. I wanna stop here and make a comment. Um, well, no, I want to stop in and, and check in with you guys. That's it for planning. That's really it. We're going to take a break. Um, I'm still trying to, I'm trying to process how to do this, how to, how to, how to now jump from planning to execution. Cause I like, I always like for there to be some, some time in between the two. Right. Um, but I just want to stop here anyways. And, um, you know, think about your plans now, what you've been doing, relate this, and just what are your overall thoughts? I guess my thoughts in general are that it's all very common sense. You know, there's not, um, there's a lot of different tools and inputs and outputs that I know need to be kind of memorized, but um, the process is very logical. If you've ever been involved in, in developing contracts and managing projects, it all seems very logical. 
Um, so I don't, I, there isn't anything that really uh, had me scratching my head, but there is a lot of uh, memorization, I think, on the different types of tools and inputs and outputs that are generated from those tools. TJ, if I may follow up on that. Please. Um, when I had a call with Scott, like about two weeks ago, and, and I let him know that some of the struggles that I showed yesterday, I was, that I was struggling with, like on the quizzes where I, I'm picking between the, the two best answers and sometimes I'm picking, of course, the wrong answer. Um, and what Scott shared with me was something, I guess, I had to beat into my head. And um, Scott yes. basically said, place yourself inside of, you know, the chart, the process chart. <laughs> and to, to try and, um, you know, when you're reading the question, to visualize what happened before and what's happening after and to really place yourself in sequence with where you're at with that chart. And it's finally, it's finally sinking in and I've been scoring better because I've been thinking that, but I'm just trying to share that with, with you guys. And I know it depends on your learning style and stuff, but I can't emphasize enough as far as just trying to, we've all got significant project experience, but just try and picture yourself inside of that chart and really what happened before, what's currently happening, what's happening after. And it just, I, I think it just, the answer comes to you more logically, just like uh, like you said. For sure. For sure, you all will, will memorize the processes. That's, that's definitely gonna help. That's where it's useful. Hey CJ, are we going till 3.30 Pacific today or three Pacific? Um, it's up to you all. It, so I, you know, let me tell you something. Um, if we if we stopped right now, we would still finish all of the material in um, in the uh, you know the rest of the time. That we the um, so you know, I'm not I'm not in a I'm not in a rush to cut anything short, but I'm also not in a rush just to give you guys a uh, fluff. So my first thing is to get feedback because the, so in classes like this, there's a rub. Let me, let me back it up a little bit. Because you, you probably asked the question for a specific reason, Ryan, and I'm going off somewhere different. So let me back no, no, it up. No, 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 no. Okay. This, is, this is good. Okay. So here's the rub. Is that, um, uh, so in addition to teaching certification classes, right, I, I also do a lot of training for companies and project management stuff, right? So there is this rub between test, um, teaching to the test teaching against like how we practically apply this material, right? So um, at this moment, I'm, I'm so ingrained on giving you everything that you need to know for, for the exam. And I'm not, and I'm, and I'm being careful not to add in a lot of the things that I'll do, let's say in a classroom setting with 18 people and we really, sometimes we'll do an exercise to dive into something like this is how you would do it in the real life, um, a scenario and, and best ways to go about it. I'm 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 leaving that part out purposely because I want I want I don't want to fill your head with anything else except what you need to do to pass the exam. With that being said, I also feel comfortable doing that. Um, and, and John, apologies because I really am focusing on the three, but I feel comfortable with that mainly because just from speaking to all I'm hearing you so far, it sounds like some of the stuff you're doing already, whether in a different you know just by a different term or whatnot, and. And so it, it's not like all foreign to you, where sometimes I, when, you know, when you're teaching this, you, you see the deer in the headlights. I'm not getting that from you guys so far, but I wanna check in because um, some people have really good poker faces. And so I wanna be able to adjust if I need to go deeper on some things, right? And look, this is, um, this is our safe environment, right? You guys all work with each other, John. I mean, John, you know, we all, you know, don't worry about anything. It's like, if you're really kind of struggling with something, like, let me know because then I'll, I'll tailor my approach you know, moving forward to, to dive into something. So, you know, I still want to hear from, from Chris and Dana a little bit. At least give me the everything's good and proceed as we have been. And, and no, it, it, it all makes sense. My issues, I think, just in, you know, the terminology and far as, you know, Understanding, I guess, and I'm going to try, you know, what John says, you know, try to figure out where you are in the chart, yeah. the question, because I think I am struggling with that, you know. That makes sense. And, you know, uh, this is, 
in theory, this is, this is the end of hour 16 or the end of day two. So in two days, you would not be expected to know, you know, all, you know, three weeks. Yeah, you'd be expected to memorize it. So right now, like, don't don't beat yourself up more about that, but more so. Um, but I'm glad that you recognize it and understand that, too. By the end of our journey here, what what I'm really what I really want to impress upon you guys is is going to be kind of what you're mentioning here, Chris. And it's going to be how you answer these questions. It's going to be less about what you know in content, because over the course of time, as you read the PMBOK, as you take practice exams, as you memorize, you're going to absorb content and memorize. Like, that's just going to happen. All right? So it's these, it's these sort of test-taking strategies. And, and um, you know, when we get to that on the last day, I'm, you know, I'm really going to dial in on, on that uh, because that's, that, that's the fast track to the success, you know, for this piece. So, so if everything is, is, is good here, then here's what I propose. We have two. We can definitely... Um, we can definitely keep to a three o'clock schedule today. Okay. Um, looking at the calendar and we'll just always do this every class. We'll kind of, you know, look forward. And so we have, we have one four hour session tomorrow. I mean, excuse me, next week, a week from now. And likely in that session, we would get through all of execution and maybe a few processes in monitoring and controlling. And then we have the following Saturday, Sunday, which is our last two days. And so then on Saturday, we have, um, uh, we have that full, we have a full day Saturday. Mm -hmm. And then we would, we would likely finish before the end of, of that, right? Because we've already been halfway through. We would finish at like 9 a.m. Pacific, so noon your time. We, we would finish in four hours on that Saturday. And then we can use the other four hours to, um, you know, either just go over and cover, like, wow, we're just going to be the full four. But at that point, we'll start going for however long you need to cover anything that, that you were unsure of. And then you could take your exam um, at 8 in the morning on Sunday, right? Start there, give yourself four hours. And then, you know, we might start a little bit later, so you have a little bit of time to review, eat some lunch, and then we can review it or... On Saturday, the first half, we finish up. The second half of the day, you take the exam. And then we show up on Sunday and we, um, and we go over it then. So we have some options when we get there. I think when we get to the end of the course on, um, on Saturday, on the last week, we'll make the decision then if, um, if you want to just take the exam the second half or if you want to cover additional topics. Right. And then, um, you know, we'll go through there. But that's what it's looking like. That's how it's shaking out so far. OK. And that's assuming if we stopped now. So we're already going to push the schedule up a little bit because we're going to start to jump into execution a little bit now. Or let me give you guys the option too. it's up to you. I'm here the rest of the day. I'm not going anywhere. So I'll, I'll continue on as long as you need me to or, or we can end here and, and regroup next week. And just start with execution. I, I wouldn't mind pushing through with execution a little bit today. Okay. Uh, maybe, like you said, maybe it's a, a three o'clock stop rather than a three thirty Pacific. Okay. Um, but I wouldn't mind. Let's do that. I believe. I believe in. So we're going to take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll have forty-five minutes. And I believe that we could get through one, two, three. We'll do these three processes because these three, I, they should be done together. So um, let's get here and, and see where we're at. And if we have time, then maybe we finish at like 305, 310. We'll see if we can do these three too. Okay, okay. let's take a quick 10 minute, um, maybe eight minutes if that's okay. Come back at, at, at 15 after. Okay. Okay. All right, so... We are now into execution. Not many processes in here. There's a two, uh, six, and eight, ten processes, and the majority, 31% of your exam, 62 questions will come just from these 10 processes. 
All right, majority, but I think it's, it's what, 31%, 30% monitoring controlling, 29% planning. It's something like that. And then like seven and nine initiating and closing in terms of the percentage of questions on your exam. So the vast majority uh, right here. Okay. Well, our whole objective here is to actually create the deliverables in this process group. Right. We want to actually create the deliverables. We want to get assignments for folks who are going to be doing the work. That's what we're trying to do here. And so um, we get the data. We get the data from, uh, from the team as well. That's a key output in this, in this uh, process group, work performance data.